So my name is Marlene Jennings. I'm president of the Quebec Community Groups Network, QCGN, and I welcome everyone to this webinar. It's quite special. I'd like to thank Madame Anglade, uh, leader of the Quebec Liberal Party, Gregory Kelly, who's an m and with the same party, and Madame Hélène David, who's also a member of the same party, also an m and and if I'm not mistaken, the official spokesperson for English for language issues. I think it's wonderful that you've agreed to join us, uh, especially in the context where the uh, CAQ government has tabled its major reform of the Charter of the French Language. And I want to thank Royal Orr for agreeing to moderate this wonderful webinar. And so I hope everyone finds it interesting, is able to ask their questions, and I turn it over to Royal. Thanks very much, Marlene. Uh, just to give people a bit of a sense of how this hour is going to run, because we do have our guests with us for an hour, um, we will have a bit of an exchange, a conversation uh, with the, the people from the Liberal Party who are with us for the first 10 minutes or so. There's three people from the community who are lined up um, to ask some questions, the questions that they have. But throughout this session, you can use the chat function to send your questions to Andrew Pellucci, who's with QCGN. And after we've gone through the conversation with Madame Anglade and her colleagues, uh, the comments and questions from uh, the representatives from the community, um, we will have still a good chunk of time to take your questions um, for Ms. Anglade and, uh, and her colleagues. So, um, I think that's pretty straightforward. Once again, you can use that chat function. That's your way to get some questions through to us. And uh, Andrew will be joining us a bit later, bringing those questions to all of you. So maybe I could start with you, Madame Anglade. What a pleasure it is to have you with us. Dominique Anglade, uh, m and from Saint-Henri, Saint-Anne, and leader of the Liberal Party of Quebec. Um, and I'm looking forward to this conversation, but I think I have to start um, with an expression, what I've heard from many people, of disappointment, of frustration, even of anger about the reaction of you and the Liberal Party to the tabling of Bill 96. Uh, people would have expected from a Liberal leader a stronger defense of individual rights, protection of minorities, uh, certainly insisting on no use of the notwithstanding clause, and people don't think they heard that, at least very clearly from you. Here we are almost a week later, on your website, still no statement, no press release, no critical analysis, certainly no call to action to stand up to these things. So my first question to you is pretty straightforward, and that is, why shouldn't people be disappointed with you and your reaction, your weak reaction to Bill 96? So let me, uh, let me start by saying hello to everybody. Uh, and uh, to say that I'm really happy to be, uh, uh, to be uh, here today. And I'm here, I know we've mentioned uh, Elaine David and, and Greg Kelly, uh, but also with me, uh, there is uh, Kathleen Wynne, uh, we have David Birnbaum, we have Jennifer Macaron as well. And before we talk about specifically uh, Bill, uh, Bill 96, uh, I would like to take a step back um, and say a few things. So first of all, I think uh, the uh, Anglophone and English speaking community, uh, English speaking Quebecers uh, have done a tremendous uh, job in like the improvement of bilingualism uh, in, in, uh, in Quebec. And over the years, we've seen that uh, the English speaking community has really taken to heart the, uh, the importance of the French language and immersion programs that have, been, uh, that have been put in place. I think it's really important to know, and when I, when I talk to the younger uh, and older generation, they're really proud of what has been accomplished within the, uh, uh, the English community. Um, taking a step back again and look at the CAC government, because I wanna be clear on something. If people wanna talk, wanna have somebody that's gonna defend Bill 96, you need to have a leader from CAC coming here and presenting Bill 96 and explaining it. With, with respect, with respect. No, 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 no. the reaction, I know. I, I, I don't want to take steps back and back and back. I want to talk about what's on the table now, which is Bill 96 and you, I will. talk to you about your reactions to it. Absolutely. is too weak. I will continue on, uh, on a few things and I'm going to talk again 
about the government that has been, when people say that the reaction of the PLQ is too weak, I would like to remind everybody that this is not the first bill that the CAC is putting forward. It was Bill 9, Bill 21, Bill 40, and I think we've been really clear on defending the liberal values on all those counts. So when people say, you know, this, this is the bill of the French language, remember all the other bills that we decided to fight at the National Assembly, despite the fact we're not in government, obviously. French language. We've known all along that the bill was coming. As a liberal party, we decided to present our own uh, proposal to, uh, to the French language because we think as the liberal party, it is important to present it. 27 uh, recommendations, 27 recommendations based on the principles, on five principles. The fact that, and, and I can just go through them and I'll answer all your questions afterwards. Uh, fundamental principles of the right to work in French, the shared responsibility that we have, the partnership that we have with the English community, and the necessity for people to have the right to choose uh, where they wanna go to school in, uh, uh, when they go to higher education. Okay, so can now, I make that the points are well taken. Your points are very well taken. This isn't the first time the notwithstanding clause has been used, and you're right. We have seen some spark and some fire from you and your colleagues on some of this other legislation. Just wondering about this one. Can we go through some of those things and just get clear? Because sometimes people only start paying attention when a one piece of legislation comes up. So clearly you are going to fight the application of the notwithstanding clause blanket uh, at the attack on the Quebec Charter of uh, Rights and Freedoms. So uh, on the, the way that CAC is using it is in a preemptive way. They're using this in a preemptive way on all the bill. We need to understand what justifies it. And we will be asking questions. Of course, we will be asking questions. There are 200, this is a very comprehensive, far reaching bill. And we will be asking questions. What we need from you is really to understand where you have the concerns. Obviously you have one with the non-withstanding clause and the, and the rights uh, that, will be, uh, that will be involved. Uh, and we need to understand where those issues are so we can actually voice, this is not our bill, this is the bill table by the CAC. Okay, your, po your point is also well taken that you've published your own comprehensive policy yes. on this five principles, 27 points, encourage people to look at them, especially principle number four, which will be reassuring, I think, to lots of English speaking Quebecers. But if we could go through these things, Addition of new clauses to the preamble of the Canadian Constitution. Do you support that approach? Do you support the CAC in this in this effort? So the CAC is saying we're going to change uh, part of the Constitution that pertains to Quebec. Uh, this is a complex question, but I think Justin Trudeau got the same uh, advice that a lot of people got. The right Quebec has the right to change that segment as long as it fits with the rest of the Constitution. The, the Constitution. That's, so that's the situation today. So that's a yes, you're on side with that one. So all I'm saying is the right, Quebec has the right to do this. If there are other uh, complex issues around this, we would love to discuss them, but this is the situation today. And that's why Justin Trudeau said what he said. Reinforcing the bureaucracies and giving them even more powers to investigate uh, language and that kind of thing. Do you support that? Well, we have to be very careful with that because what we've said all along, for example, the creation of the ministry, uh, we did not bring that forward. We, we did not think it was a necessity to bring that forward. We recommend that there was a commission, uh, a commissionary person uh, responsible to really provide a good independent analysis on this. So bureaucracy is not something that we want to promote, Def not part of our DNA. Okay, franchisation pushed down to companies 25 to 49 employees. Do you support that? In a light, in a, in a light version of Bill 101. So it's not like, oh, we take like Bill 101, we just apply it to 25 to uh, 90, uh, to 90 people, uh, to, to uh, 50 people. In our proposal, that's what we had. We said, you know, is there a light way of doing that? Okay. Caps on English language SEGEP, 17.5% or something like that. That's what they're going to say. They say the magic number is. What do you say? I'll go back to the recommendations that we put together because what is in the bill today is not something that I can, I don't have, it's extremely complex what is in the bill right now. Even the people that um, are very familiar with the numbers don't fully understand where, where they're coming from. The biggest concern we have right now on this issue is the fact that you have CGEPs uh, that are not necessarily Montreal, outside of Montreal, that could get impacted and that would have like fewer students and, and 
that could uh, basically reduce the level of services for English communities. We're concerned with that, and this is something that we're definitely going to look in, uh, th th going to look at. Definitely, because the, the yeah, yeah. Uh, just one element that is a key principle for us is that we have, let's say, we have a million English-speaking Quebecers. Uh, in, uh, uh, in Quebec, we want to make sure that all services are maintained for the English community. Okay, last one on this one, bilingual status for municipalities. Are you supporting this comprehensive review and pulling the status of bilingualism from the places that currently have them but that may have dipped I, under 50%? I think we need to be very careful in like addressing it. Again, what really matters is the services. We understand, we understand from the bill that the municipalities are going to be able to keep uh, to keep their status if they if they want to, but again, this is something that we will investigate. I think if the municipalities can keep their uh, uh, their, uh, their their status, uh, I, I, I think it's a good I think it's a good thing. Okay, one last question before we turn to some of our community people who are with us for their questions. But that is, I guess, it's more of a general question, Ms. Anglad, which is. The, the kind of ethno-nationalist perspective on these things seems to have the high ground at this point, both in terms of poll support, in terms of uh, media and elite reaction to this. Um, you are the leader of liberal forces, small L and large L in this province. How are you going to take this on? Because this, as you point out, is more, you know one in a series, but in some ways this has become the highest profile one, maybe with the exception of Bill 21. But still, what, where does where does a small L liberal turn to listen to hear a defense of liberal values? Are you talking to a, a, a black female leader of the Liberal Party? Like if I honestly uh, understanding the the rights of minorities, understanding uh, what it's like to be different, I think I have a pretty good uh, understanding of all those issues. And I think that my core values, my core values are completely oriented towards that. So when we look at bills, when we look at the previous bills, and it's the same way we're going to look at this bill, when we look at previous bills, does that make sense? Does it, is, it, is it the right thing to do? These are the questions that we're going to ask ourselves and making sure that we, we protect the rights of, uh, of minorities. And for critics who say um, or, 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 or suggest that you are soft peddling this, that you are underplaying those core values for electoral considerations, that you need to break out of your support base in Montreal, et cetera, et cetera, what do you say to them that you're, you're watering I, through your values? I stick to all my values. And the people that say that stuff obviously don't know me very well. Like I defend the rights of minorities. I make sure that we all, all voices are heard. Uh, and we need to hear all the voices, obviously from uh, uh, English speaker Quebecers uh, in the Montreal region, but from all the regions that are represented. And that's the reason why we're there. That's the reason why you have on the skull uh, other five other MNAs that are part of participating in this because it is important to us. And what matters, again, we're not a majority government in power today. If we were a majority government, the bill that we would have proposed would not have been the one that is tabled today. But right now, our role is to be able to voice the concerns that you have and make sure that we do our job responsibly. Let's hear some of those voices. I think we've got a couple or three people lined up here. So I'm, I don't have a list of names. So who, who have we got with a question? All right. So uh, let me just promote them to panelists. We have Eleni Bakopanos, who's going to be asking a question. I believe, Eleni, you should be able to unmute yourself and you should be able to ask your question. Then we have Kevin Contant, who is the president of the Dawson Student Union. He'll be able to unmute himself as well to ask a question. And Madeline Lawler, who's the president of Why for Why. Okay. Uh, so, Eleni, are you there? Yes. Hi, Royal. It's been a while. <laughs> and uh, thank you, uh, Dominique Anglad. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeff, uh, Gregory, I, I'm sorry I called you your father, but I had worked with your father, as you know, Gregory, <laughs> and uh, Madame David. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I, I've been in government, so I understand how difficult it is. And I've been on the government side, rather the opposition. So I understand that obviously you, you have a long road in front of you in terms of trying to bring forth either amendments. But what disturbs me as a member of a minority group in Quebec and having fought for a very, very long time alongside Royal and Marlene and others for minority rights, the notwithstanding clause was introduced in the constitution as an exception, not to be abused or overused. 
And I feel that Bill 96, in fact, abuses that right. And I don't want to go into the fact that they want to change the Constitution from the back door. That's a, that to me is very disturbing. OK, but what disturbs me is if they had said they wanted to use the notwithstanding clause for one thing. OK, but to try to put it throughout the bill is an abuse of what that uh, clause was intended for when it was introduced at the federal level. So as a woman also of minority, I know you understand the minorities, uh, Madame Anglade, you and I have had an opportunity to speak and I thank you very much recently. Also, you spoke on uh, for me at the award of the National Assembly, which I'm very, very proud of, of that award. But I know you understand, but I think there has to be a real thorough, thorough uh, critique of the use of notwithstanding clause throughout the whole bill in every, I know they've, they've have made some changes. I'm sorry, I'm going, I'll, I'll just ask the question. I feel very disturbed that it was abused, that notwithstanding. So what are you gonna do is what I'm asking in terms of making sure that that clause and notwithstanding clause is not used as freely as it is in bill 96. So that's why we need to really understand what justifies the, the use of that, uh, of that, uh, of that clause, because uh, again, our understanding today, but again, this is something that needs to be further discussed and, and, uh, and, and understood, but it, it, it goes throughout the bill. We need to understand why, what justifies that? What are we getting ourselves into? Uh, what, what, what is the intent? When you, do, when you do something as a legislator, you have an intention. What is the intent of the legislator uh, in this? And those are the questions that we, will be, uh, that we will be asking for sure. And I understand the question around uh, preemptive, like they've, they've done it with Bill 21. Uh, we know that. Uh, we've expressed our opinions on Bill, 101, uh, on Bill 21 already. Uh, and this one, we'll have to ask all those questions that, uh, to really fully understand what is, uh, what is the intent on this. Thank you, Eleni. Uh, can I just do a quick follow up on that, uh, Ms. Anglad, to maybe speak specifically about the Quebec Charter, because that is a, you know, that's a liberal, I mean, that was a liberal creation. That's so yeah. deep in the, in, the, in the history of your party, so deep in the, in, the, in the life of Quebec society, to allow the CAC to get away with just literally setting the Quebec Charter aside. It's just astonishing that they're getting away with this. Well, you've seen you've seen it in Bill Twenty One as well, right? I mean, you've seen it yeah. with with the use of a of a, a non-withstanding clause. And again, in this particular one, it was the rights of uh, specific people. So again, this time around, we really need to understand what justifies it. What what article justifies the use of the sentence clause? Right? Thank you, Ellen. We move on now to Kevin. Kevin, you have a comment or a question or an observation? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Royal. Um, I, like, like Chelsea had mentioned, I'm the uh, chairperson of the Dawson Student Union. And of course, uh, we have, well, our, our, our institution has been a lot in the limelight these past uh, few months, especially with our expansion project. Um, and of course, uh, recently with the limitation of uh, the capping, the hard cap on the amount of students who uh, could in the future attend uh, English as CJEP. So my question generally revolves around um, English CGEPs outside of the greater Montreal area. And of course, that's where the majority of the, uh, we could say historical Anglophone community, they're found within that, that area. So of course, that begs the question, the severe limitation of obviously number of Francophones who can attend English CGEPs uh, puts obviously off island CGEPs at risk. Um, this is obviously to the detriment, not just of our community, but of all Quebec. So what would be your position on this specific issue on the capping of uh, seats available to francophones in English CGEPs. So this is a very, uh, uh, and especially you right mentioning the, the CGEPs outside of, uh, of Montreal, this is really something that, we, uh, that we're really concerned about uh, because it would have an impact again on the services that it provided to uh, the English community if that was to be the case and ultimately that the CGEPs would be impacted uh, and could, you know, I'm not talking about, uh, but reduce their level, level reduce their, their programs, uh, that would have an, a significant impact on the community. So we are definitely concerned with that. As I said earlier, uh, we don't fully understand the, 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 the calculations that they're making in the bill today. Again, we've talked with different specialists. They don't fully understand. So there are a number of questions that still need to be, uh, to be asked, but this is definitely a concern that we have and we would not have taken down this path, limiting specifically the francophones from what I understand in that bill. Uh, is, uh, uh, is problematic, but again, further work needs to be done. And by the way, I'm, I'm here with, again, I said I'm here with uh, 
uh, my colleagues m and a so if the one of them whether it's a greg or elen that you want to speak feel please feel free to uh, to do so as well yes yeah, certainly welcome their input on these things and I'll go a, a quick follow up on that one and, and you know I heard a commentator on Radio Canada the other day saying when they looked at this bill it just sort of looked like a 40 year old approach to promoting the French language toughened a little bit here and there as opposed to something that took account of what's really going on now in terms of language use in Quebec and what we can really do to encourage the French language and French culture without doing things like you know contravening the charters and 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 and, and, and encroaching on, on minority rights from your perspective, what would be a 2021 approach to promoting the French language that doesn't, doesn't just involve, you know, constricting access to English language institutions um, and, and setting aside fundamental rights? We are 8 million uh, people in Quebec uh, speaking French, but we are 300 million people in the world speaking French. I mean, the reality, the, the, the world is ours to take, honestly. Uh, on the on those issues, and if you think about uh, uh, people loving the French language, being excited about the French language, I have three children uh, that I'm raising in three different languages, and you see, uh, ha having that French language in the, in Netflix, like having the, uh, the culture shared with uh, other regions of the world, I think there is a world to be concurred in the concurred in the in the French language that we're really not tapping into, to tell you the truth. And that's something that we definitely should be focused on uh, if we want to have people find the, the language attractive and uh, for people to uh, to feel that they can uh, study in French abroad, uh, create other links, and of course learn uh, learn English. Well, maybe I'll bring. Well, this is a more modern approach because the this the, this issue on 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 the, the whole digital strategy uh, should be really uh, should be really uh, looked into, in my opinion. And maybe we could bring in Madame David on this one too, because that's what she she follows for you as the critic for the French language. But I mean, it, it does seem to me though that that global perspective that you're talking about is definitely not what's being promoted with this particular bill, and there is such a a, like a media elite, which is sort of primed to say that anything like what you just said isn't a true defense of the French language or the culture of Quebec. So how do you take on that segment of the population and the intelligentsia and the media elite and try and get through the point that you just made, which is it's a global language. It should be done out of love. It should be encouraged in these kinds of ways. I, I, you or Madame, Madame David, perhaps you got some perspective on that. Royal, I could chime in that uh... You know, I tabled Bill 590 that would make free French language courses available to anyone who resides in the province of Quebec, because there are a lot of people out there who will say, I, I, I speak French, but, you know, I'm not perfect, but I would love to be able to communicate better with my community organization where people are bilingual. I think that's a way you can modify a charter and bring in positive rights for people. So that is one, one example, Royal, that I will throw out there that we put forward on the table, which I think is forward thinking about the French language and making it accessible to anybody who wants to learn it. And they picked up on it and took you up on that offer and there it is. So, I mean, the CAC just grabbed the idea and ran with it. And frankly, Matt's your book good. I'm going to be thrilled with that approach to promoting French. But Madame David, you've got a perspective on this yeah, too. Yeah, but the, it's, the, it's the same thing that uh, Greg is, uh, is, is saying. It's about like international students at McGill or Concordia or Dawson, they will have free French courses and they will be, able to, to work in, in a different, uh, on St. Catherine Street, for example, because we think there's, there's a need uh, on, uh, in, in downtown Montreal to be more uh, French speaking. So uh, it's good for all the international students to be able to, to learn French. And that has to be free because it's very expensive to follow some uh, French courses now if we are, are attending English uh, universities or even French universities. So it's very good and it, it's very good to recruit them in, in different uh, areas in Montreal and they can stay with us, they can fall in love with Quebecers and they can stay forever in Quebec, speaking both probably French, English, Spanish, Chinese, uh, anything else. All right, this makes total sense to people who kind of know the Montreal scene. Is this going to work for you in Bas Saint Laurent? Is this going to work from you work for you in Santa Quebec when you have to go out there and, and fight a battle where you say we're going to do it with love and encouraging international students to speak French? I'm a little skeptical of that. 
Yeah, but I think, yeah. you know what, I was, as I was, if I, if I, if I may say, and Elan, please add to this, if I may say, when I was a CEO of, uh, of Montreal International and we're attracting uh, talent and investments in, a, in, in the Quebec region, um, I think we have programs that are very attractive. Uh, unfortunately, if I talk of the program PEC, the program d'expérience québécoise, where you attract students in different regions, uh, international students uh, in, a, a, in a, everywhere, everywhere in Quebec, it was so popular that CAC decided to cut the program because they were getting too many people from outside. I mean, that's the reality of things. So, but these are programs that are really positive, bringing a, a modern approach to what we do uh, in Quebec in general. Hélène, je ne sais pas si... Kevin, thanks for that. Yeah. Let us hand okay. it in this direction. Can I go now to Madeline? Madeline, you've got a question or a comment for us? Yeah, thank you, Royal. Um, my name is Madeline Lawler, and I'm president of Youth for Youth Quebec, a nonprofit representing English speaking youth across Quebec. Uh, so, speaking of representing underrepresented voices, youth are often forgotten in these debates. A lot of English speaking youth are feeling disengaged and disenchanted from the language debate even though it's younger and future generations that will live the majority of their lives under the new linguistic landscape. They don't see themselves represented, nor solutions to address their problems in Bill 96, even though the government included language courses as part of the measures to help our community, something that was also proposed by the Quebec Liberal Party. While those language courses are important, the issues facing youth in our community on the linguistic front go beyond that and require other measures of support. It takes more than language classes to tackle issues of underemployment, underrepresentation, and retention. My question is twofold. How would the Quebec Liberal Party differ in approach and policy to incorporate youth voices and concerns? And second, how will your party address the feelings of political disillusionment among youth and represent these needs and concerns during the debate on Bill 96? Good questions. Who'd like to lead off on those? I can start, but I'm sure Greg uh, will uh, will have a, a number of comments on that as well. Um, so, first of all, again, I, I think we need as a Liberal Party to do reach out and talk to the community is, and, and make sure that uh, the, the voice is being heard. So, again, as part of Bill 90, like part of Bill 96, we need to have those contacts and exchange and propose things. So, if there are ideas that you want to bring forward, like we really. Uh, we really want to listen. Uh, we really want to listen to them. Uh, that's the that, that's the first uh, first element. Uh, I would love. I mean, from the bottom of my heart, when we looked at the information, uh, everything that we put together, all the recommendations we put together uh, for the French language, always, always keep in mind that we said, okay, we need to make sure that we do this in an inclusive way, that we don't get a debate between French and English, that we really uh, talk about the the services that the community uh, uh, need to have. So those are all the questions that are constantly on our minds in order to, uh, uh, to represent uh, the community well. And then you need to measure results. When you talk about underrepresentation, uh, we need to look at the results and say like what year after year, where is the progress? Where is the problem? You need to have a political will to do that, but where is the progress for the English community? Dans la fonction publique, where is the progress of the English speaking community? These are the measures that we need the government to be transparent with uh, in order to, uh, to really have an impact. Because if you don't measure it, it's never going to happen. It's, sort of, it's still going to be people saying, oh, it's important to better represent uh, uh, the English speaking community, but with no result. I don't know if you want to comment on this, Greg. Yeah, Maddie, uh, do you mind, how are you doing, Maddie? Uh, do, do you mind just on your first question, are you talking about like structures within government or a little bit more just saying like the English speaking community retention of youth uh, in general and how can we shape economic policies? And I'll answer at least on the civil service one because everyone here has been talking about this for a very long time. Uh, the secretariat, I know there's some people who are on this uh, Zoom today who are from the secretariat, very curious to know what you guys think about Bill 96. Um, but we put into place in 2018, trying to find a way to coordinate with the Conseil de Trésor, who does the hiring and is responsible for the fonction public, the civil service. They need to go into our English universities and recruit. We now have an MPA program at Concordia, one that's at, at McGill. How can we, A, go there and say, we want you to come work in the Quebec civil service? Because when I went to Queens, Ottawa was there, uh, Toronto Queens Park was there. They were trying to get the students from my MPA program to take stages, go work in the government and keep talent uh, and find the best talent. Right now, we're not doing that. And the Quebec Civil Service and our English institutions don't talk very much. Maybe there's been some progress. I think that's at least one way to try to filter in more students directly. 
And the government needs to help those students who do get stabbed in the Quebec government, make sure that they can work in the French language, provide them with all the training they need, give them the space to really work in the French milieu, which is somebody who did it back in 2010. It's not the easiest thing to do in the world. That is at least how I see it. But there's a whole question of an exam and all that. But if you do just kind of mind, Maddie, going back to your first question, so I can just really understand what you mean by having the youth really be fully, you know, participating in, in society. It was basically the latter part. I think a lot of the discussion right now is saying that, you know, language classes are going to fix things, uh, which is not entirely true. There's a lot of issues that extend beyond just language, yeah. classes, which I think you touched on. I, some of the rhetoric is that if we give young Anglophones classes and their resources to improve their French, they're going to have jobs in the civil service. I don't think that's entirely true. A lot of the time and a lot of the younger generation is very bilingual, especially in Montreal. A lot of us are super bilingual. The main issue is the fact that we doubt how bilingual we are, but actually objectively how bilingual uh, young Anglophones are. And to go back to the whole public service thing on that note, um, I mean, we have measures. There's data out there. <laughs> the data has existed for a long time and we still don't see improvements. So, I mean, I, I take that so, so can we get a quick comment from you, Greg, on that more general issue? Yeah, and I think the part of that too, I mean, like if we're thinking about retaining our youth and the brain drain that we see, which is which is really present and, and you know, when you see the numbers, it will, will shock you. And also the unemployment numbers, English speaking community versus uh, the French speaking community. It's a huge issue, but working, Chambre de Commerce, they could play a role, universities too, and making sure that they care about what their students do afterwards. We're not going to keep every single student here who's bilingual. It's an international world. We get that. But there has to be some tailored policies put into place that really try to focus on stages and keeping people working in Montreal or in the regions who have a lot of talent instead of losing them to other jurisdictions. Okay, Madeline, recognizing that these people aren't the government right now, they are the opposition. Are you satisfied with the answers you got? I'll be satisfied with the answers if I see those same answers in the National Assembly when things get heated on Bill 96. Um, <laughs> I, I, I want to see the representation that I haven't so far seen, especially from for English speaking youth in particular. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much, Madeline, for that question and those exchanges. Andrew, I think we need to come to you and uh, you've been gathering up some questions that have come in on the chat. So uh, maybe we can pose some of those and we'll see how, how our guests want to respond to them. Uh, okay. So there's been a, a lot of questions. I'm going to try and synthesize two together right now about two areas really we haven't talked about too much just yet. Um, what would you say to Anglophones or English speakers in the regions? And what would you say to English, speaker, English speaking seniors who are worried about this bill impacting their ability to access services in English, especially for seniors at this point who may not be as bilingual and let's be honest, may not be interested in taking a course to learn French at this point in their life? To that, to that question, there's no, no doubt we will defend the rights of the English speaking community to get services the way they are getting services today. And in fact, some of them might not be getting all the services that they need today. So we want to make sure that we protect this. And in fact, it's not, it's not only that we're saying this today, we've been saying this all along. Whenever there's been a motion at the National Assembly uh, around uh, the language, we've always been the ones saying, listen, we're going to do this, but we want to make sure that all the, the, the the services uh, are the English services are protected. So this is something that has been consistent throughout. Greg, maybe something uh, about, uh, in the regions, the English speaking communities there and some particular concerns about Bill 96 and in, 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 which is on the table now. Yeah, no, no, for sure. And you know, one of the things too, a lot of people here will recognize, you know, the access plans, it's one thing to have them, but are the resources there uh, financially to make sure that they can be executed. I think one area that we've seen for sure, and this does touch seniors, you know, mental health, uh, our services are being stretched thin in all languages across the province. And that's, you know, of a particular concern, but also two services being delivered to the English speaking community. We saw during the pandemic, you know, pamphlets going out concerning COVID that were only in French. We knew a lot of our seniors. I heard it at my writing office saying, Greg, I need this documentation in English. It's super pertinent. So there's things like that. We have to make sure the government is always owning up uh, to its side and also on municipalities too keeping a close eye, that motion idea that's presented, um, you know, we have to make sure that uh, places there are 25% of, you know, the population, we don't see a huge reducing of municipal services, the English language, because motions don't get passed. So 
how some type of flexibility could further flexibility could be built into the law is something we have to ask questions about. Great. Just to be clear, you think there could indeed be an impact as a result of Bill 96, even if it's just the kind of environment it creates in terms of how people perceive things? Um, it's something you have to keep, uh, you know, a close eye on um, that we don't want to see that type of dialogue. Well, there's Bill 96. and I don't have to service people in English. Uh, that's not the case. We're going to have to be you know, very cautious that that's not the path that we go down, that the services and the rights that we do have that exist presently are no way reduced or taken off the table. And we have to ask, there's 100 articles in this bill. They're major, major things. It's a huge, you know, we're going to have to hear from you know, lawyers from the community too who say, hey, here, you, we have to ask some questions specifically. Will this change services in some way? Will it change the work, you know, the language in some areas of the workplace? Again, there's a lot of theoretical questions out there. And the minister is going to have to answer that when we go to the National Assembly and we are in commission to reassure people that their services and rights are not being taken away uh, and the health acts and, and services we have currently. Okay, I'm pushing people along, but there's a lot of questions here. And I, I, know, I know we want to get to as many as we possibly can. So, Andrew, yeah. some more questions. Well, that, Greg, to that point, you're just saying, can you kind of maybe explain to everyone here um, what the next steps are going to be and how this process is going to, or Dominic, how this is going to unfold going forward now? Sure. Uh, but in fact, Hélène is probably the best person to talk about the flow uh, from, now, from now on, because she's going to be uh, uh, the, this fourth person on the bill. So maybe you can explain the flow, uh, Hélène. I think we will work very hard in the next uh, few months, in the next many, many months, because uh, I don't think we will be over uh, before Christmas. Uh, so starting from now, consultations, uh, private consultations like we are doing right now uh, after that public consultations are going on uh, we will uh, decide but those are with leaders are, are talking together to see what kind of consultation will be on is it more uh, particular consultations or general consultations that is the, the the issue we have to to decide but the minister will decide and after that all the consultation the public consultations uh, as we we had with the bill 21 and uh, after that we will go to the detail study article by article by article so we will spend many many hours in commission to uh, ask all the question we, we, we need to ask. Madam David, who, who will be your allies in this? Who are you looking to for support? Who are you going to hoping, who are you hoping you'll hear from in some of those public forums? Um, who can you turn to who's going to support these kinds of attitudes to individual rights, to minority rights, to protecting the charters, both Quebec and Canadian? Where are the friends? Your question is very oriented, we could say, uh, because you say, people who will be with you. Many people will be with us. Many people will ask us to, will say, oh, can you ask this question? Can you ask this question? We need more details on this article. Just Greg just said that we have to, to ask questions about the Anglophone speaking person in, in the regions and about the CJEPs and about the, the services. So we will have many people who will try to, to, to have answers to those questions, but we, we will have to read and ask questions to the people who will come and testify with, with, a, uh, with a paper, with something, and they, you will come probably for, from the QCGN at the, the commission, I'm quite sure. But are you anticipating, like, for example, Chambre de Commerce or, or some of the other people who are concerned about the impact of things like France? We are constantly in contact with the Chambre de Commerce, with the Conseil du Patronat, with the CJEPs, with the universities, with, uh, with, with you, with so many people. So people are talking to us and are saying, OK, we would like you to ask this question. We, we are, you know, anxious about this, this, this thing or the other thing. Yeah. Andrew, some more comments. Roy, some comments. Greg, finish your, finish your thought. I was also going to say, Royal, that everyone here can also comment themselves on the bill and it does get registered. You see every comment that is written in it and it, you know, it's a way of expressing yourself. Um, but the other thing uh, too, and again, inviting you, when Hélène has to go for, before the bill, on our side, we have, you know, a few researchers but we're up against a government structure that has tons of lawyers and there's really a, you know, it's, it's not an equal assist footing here. Uh, we're, we're the opposition. We do our work hard. The government has all their lawyers who can provide all of the advice they want. So 
again, inviting you guys to, to reach out to us after this. If you, you have any suggestions or have read through the bill and you have some specific concerns, try to, try to let us know because that's the, again, the best way we can try to represent your concerns in Quebec City. Hey, let me, before I go back to Andrew, ask one question, probably for Madame Anglade, and hope, hoping this gets you in lots of trouble, but are you looking to Ottawa for any kind of support here? What do you expect from the Prime Minister or from, uh, from elected representatives, Liberals primarily, in Ottawa in terms of this fight? Uh, honestly, it's really their perspective, what they're hearing on the ground. Uh, we also, when they, we say, uh, we also in contact with, uh, with the MPs, uh, and how they see this being applied, the concerns that they hear. Uh, this is what we're here for. This is the actual process. It's getting down to getting this information, understanding where those issues are, highlighting things that we might not have seen and, and making sure that those questions are asked, that we bring amendments. And uh, that's, the, the, that's the work that we expect from the MPs as well uh, in, uh, in Quebec. So was Mr. Trudeau's intervention yesterday helpful where he said it was possible possible to jam two new clauses into the uh, into the preamble of the constitution well he's the he's the he's the prime and prime minister i uh, I, I take that he has to answer this question at some point <laughs> andrew oh there was a quick question greg uh, i i noticed that it popped up which is where can people put their comments what what system do they use to register their, their mm -hmm. concerns? yeah I, I don't know i'll talk with andrew uh, i'll try to send him the link now just so he could post it in the chat the section where you can comment on legislation the national assembly yeah, got it. Okay, Andrew, back to you for another question. Okay, I'll, I'll once again try and combine two questions here. Um, sorry, let me find out what it is. Oh, yes. Um, how do we anticipate the right to work in French impacting the right to receive services in English? Question one, and same thing kind of regarding the use of signs. Uh, the predominance of French signs going forward, how will that impact the availability of English signage at all? Well, to me, uh, I'll let uh, Eden answer on, on, on signage. But in terms of uh, in terms of services, I mean, people are getting services today in in English uh, for the English community. Uh, so I I assume that this is will that this will have to work hand in hand. And again, uh, like we said at the beginning, we don't see this as one against the other. It's not because. Uh, uh, the uh, English-speaking community in Quebec is receiving is receiving services in English that French is not going well in in, in Quebec. I mean, this is the, these are two separate things, and I think I think we should look at it this way separately. Uh, but again, this is something that we will be uh, we will be very uh, we will be looking at. We'll be looking at. Uh, we can't we can't compromise on the uh, on the services. Madam David, have you something to add? Yeah. Uh... The, the article 29.1, which is the article for the, the, the minority for the English speaking community is still there. And uh, people will be protected, will keep their rights uh, because they will have, a, how do you say, a close grandpère about if they were you know, having a communication in English. Uh, read the read the bill very carefully, and you will find that they will be protected. And the the Article twenty nine point one uh, is still there, quite the same. And I would say about the the signs that you know that's uh, Claude Ryan did it in nineteen ninety three. What did he What did he do after the the, the notwithstanding clause of nineteen eighty eight uh, by Robert Bourassa? He chose the predominance. So it's the Liberal Party who did it. Mm -hmm. So we were comfortable with that at that time. The, the thing I did myself in 19 in 2016 was the, the equality, we could say, between the, the, the sign and, and what is written as a uh, a sentence, a word, or it, it was equal with like the, the, the sign Best Buy or Costco or things like that. Now they are introducing a little bit bigger like the predominance mean. Uh, but, you know, we did it in 1993. We did it ourselves. So 
let's keep going here. More comments or more questions or comments from people online. And uh, we still have a good 10 minutes here. So you might even have a chance to still get a question in. If you use the chat function, it'll go directly to Andrew. And he's then bringing those questions to our guests. Uh, Andrew. So a question about um, the ongoing desire by the current government to define what an English speaker or what an Anglophone is. As this one goes, there will be a, a limit on CGEPs and there will be a priority for English speakers to get into those CGEPs, but how would that be defined? Um, as it looks now, it says those who came from the English system, but what about those who are English speaking, who are, had to go to the French system, but then would want to go back to the English system? Will they have that right as well? Any, any thoughts on that? They will keep that right, even if they, they did attend the French school and they were allowed to, to go to the English uh, school. So that will be quite a challenge for the, the Minister of Higher Education to, to, to you know, have, but they have codes and they know who have the right to attend the English speaking uh, uh, colleges. So uh, they will have the priority. They will be uh, chosen first. And after that, all the, the available spaces will be given to other people who want to attend the English speaking uh, CGEP. As I said, there will be no difference uh, in, in the attendance of English speaking colleges in like next September or the September after because of the 17.5%, which is actually the case in the English speaking CGEPs. But this is clearly a complex issue, right? Because there's not only this question which has been raised because of Bill 96, but there is a question about accessibility for Anglophones to CEGEPs. And I think we've all heard those stories of, you know, unless you have a 95% average out of high school, you can't get into pure and applied sciences in an English language CEGEP. So um, maybe turning to, and again, recognizing that a lot of these things, the details about how this would apply are the kinds of things you're gonna to try to dig out as you're going through the process of clause by clause and investigating these things with the minister. Of but, course, of course, we yeah. are already digging out. What, what did we do with our own plan? We said the CGEP uh, English first, English speaking first. We did it. Uh, all right, it's it. already there on the table. Um, and oh my goodness, I see Kathleen Weil, I see David Burke. Yeah. We have a whole celebration of liberals here <laughs> all of a sudden. <laughs> oh, and David actually has his hand up. Is that- Me too, me too. I have my hand up, but it's not showing. Okay, so let me, let me get a quick comment here. Um, uh, we'll start with David, because he, he did actually find his little hand to put up there. So I'll come to Kathleen after that. David, good, uh, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you, Royal. Really good to be here. I just want to remind you that you heard from Dominic that a line in the sand that cannot be crossed. And for those of us and all of you who've been involved, it's that essential line, which is delivery of services to one million English speaking Quebecers. And let's remember that it's our liberal vision that that notion, something the community has worked so, so hard to instill, is an institutional responsibility. And I say that because it doesn't run against one of the most essential and popular parts of language legislation in Quebec with 95% of the population, and that is the protection of the right to work in French. These two concepts can and must live in coexistence, and they can. Like I say, the obligation to deliver services in English to that one million Quebecers must be protected. We're not at all convinced that the CAC is sold on that, but it can be done through the obligation for institutions to provide those services. And okay. of course, certain individuals to be able to deliver those services, but it does not run counter to the right to work in French. We'll David, I mean, I everybody would agree with you, probably everyone listening in terms of the principles you're putting out there. But what I think people want to hear is how are you going to fight this thing? Because, you know, principles are fine, but when you get into the cut and thrust of actually what turns into legislation and what's the impact of it, what they want to hear, I think, from liber liberals is, do you have the spine and the spunk to take on this fight? So the short answer is yes. The short answer is yes. I mean, that's exactly why we, Hélène was saying like right at the beginning, when we issued our own statement, we were very clear on that. So there's no, there's, there's no question in our mind. Now it's gonna be detail article by article that we will have to go through this, but we've been very clear all along on this issue. Kathleen, hi, welcome to the hi. conversation. Yeah, no, I've, been, I've been listening from the beginning. Is my, my mic is open? Yes. yes. 
Yes, it is. Okay, so I just wanted to say there's something else. Greg and I did a, took a tournée du Québec and we visited the, the communities, institutions everywhere. There's a blind spot uh, when it comes to English community and we're not frozen in time and it shouldn't be a static process that let's take a snapshot of where the English community is and protect their rights. You remember the whole debate around preserve and, pr and promote. And um, I think that vision has to find itself in this bill and through the work that Hélène's gonna do and Dominique and all of us. And what struck me when I went to all of the different regions was uh, the poor, the poor, the, the, the communities are often poorer and they put it that way and they don't have services, especially in the schools because they don't have the resources necessary to respond to the needs. So a little three-year-old that has delays in learning gets no no help, no support. And we have to be careful ourselves as, as members of the English community to not look at our situation as static. Um, and people have a tendency of thinking the English community is rich. They think everybody lives in a big house in Westmount. Uh, they think of it as the Montreal community. They forget about the communities and the regions. And so we've got to make sure that, that we bring that to the table as well. And that the provisions, because it, 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 you know, it takes note, first of all, the roots that we have, the pro progress, enormous, I think uh, other people mentioned it, but enormous strides in terms of learning the language. Everybody's bilingual, but also what struck me when we went to visit them is they have developed relationships with their sisters, with their institutions and, um, and a respect, a mutual respect. Let's Thank just you. put it that way. Thank you, Kathleen. We're coming down to the bottom of the clock and the, and, the, and the end of the time we have together. I've been pushing all the questions at you, Madame Anglade. I think I should give you a couple of minutes here at the end just to talk to the hundred or so folks who are listening to this in terms of what's, what's coming up and how you're going to be leading your team through this. Listen, uh, we, we, we spent about an hour talking about uh, the, uh, uh, the French language, but I would like to talk about like what what unites us? Like, what's our vision, a collective vision for Quebecers? Um, it, from the very get-go for me, what was really important is that we don't divide ourselves against that. We can promote French language and make sure that the, uh, the uh, English community, English speaking community feels like perfectly like any other Quebecer and part of the whole, uh, uh, part of this, uh, uh, this great province. And, and unfortunately we, this tension is, is, we feel it because of other bills that have passed, et cetera. But I really hope that we can get through this together uh, and stronger. And the reality also, uh, and I know I'm diverting just a little bit from the French language, but we have a society that we need to build after the pandemic. We have to think about what type of uh, society we want to have in terms of in the economy, in terms of the environment, in terms of those social issues. And we have a lot more that unite us than things that divide us. So I, my, my call is let's not get people that want to divide us between, between us, but let's regroup and make sure that we have a vision for the future. That's really what I'm passionate about. And I certainly hope that we're gonna do all the fights that we need to, uh, to do with the, uh, with the uh, Bill 96. But at the same time, I mean, we need to think about the future for Bill and how we're gonna build this province further. That's really what I think all the MNAs that are here are really passionate about. And that involves every single Quebecer. Ms. Anglade, what a pleasure to talk with you today. Thanks very much for your time. Same thank you to Mr. Kelly, uh, to Ms. David, to David Birnbaum, to Kathleen, uh, to Kathleen Weil. Thank you to Marlene for the introduction to the session. Also, especially want to thank Andrew for uh, gathering those questions together and bringing them to us, the three people from the community who shared their perspectives for us, and most especially to everybody who joined us. So thank you very much. We look forward to speaking with you again at some time. Who knows where this is going to take us, but it's been a great pleasure to talk to you all. Thank you all. Thank you to everybody.